All right, going to continue with the UEFI development here. I want to probably continue with reading files from the disk or from the disk image. Last time I read from the EFI system partition and the files on there, but that has a set file system within it. The file allocation table, uh, FAT32 is what I used. But what if you don't have a file system on a partition? How do you read from the disk if there's not any set structure on there? When I'm making the disk image, I also make a basic data partition. So if I just do this by default, we can see we have a data size, which is the data partition size, as opposed to the EFI system partition. And this data partition, which is one meg by default, doesn't have any set structure. It doesn't have a file system. It's a big blank array of bytes. So how do we read from that? There are things within the UEFI spec that we can use, such as block IO protocol. And these things are in chapter 19, or chapter 13, rather. So 13.9, so block IO protocol, there's also disk IO protocol, and I'll probably use partition info as well, partition information protocol, just to get the type of partition we're looking at. But block IO is sort of how you can, uh, how you can branch out to the other ones, and it includes things like a media struct or a pointer to it, which has info on whatever partition or sort of block device you're looking at. So the block IO protocol specifically, it abstracts storage devices. So it could be a hard drive, an SSD, a USB flash drive, a SCSI disk, an NVMe, what have you. It doesn't have all the info for like the manufacturer or anything other than like the set size and if it's read only, stuff like that. So it would be nice to have like an identify command for ATA. And there is that there's, you know, ATA pass through protocol allows that. But if you just want a view of all the devices for storage, all the partitions on those, then block IO is a way to get to that fairly easily. So it has, it's pretty simple. It has read and write blocks. And if there's caching involved, you have flush blocks as well to make sure the data is actually written to the media. What it mainly gives you is this media struct here or a pointer to that, which gives you some flags, such as if it's removable, I'm assuming a flash drive would have that be true. If it's present in the system, maybe it's hot pluggable or something and it was there, but now it's not. This might be false in that situation. A logical partition, yes, would mean if it's a partition and not the whole device, or if the whole disk only has one partition, this is also true. So that's kind of, <laughs> that kind of sucks. There's two different ways of trying to check if it's a partition. And we have a flag for read only, a flag for write caching, which I'm assuming if this write caching flag is true, then for block IO protocol, you'd have to use flush blocks to make sure the data is actually written. But I haven't really seen many drives yet for what I have personally to where that is actually true, but I'm sure they're out there. The block size should be the, the internal block size for the device. Usually it's emulated as 512 bytes, whether or not the drive is actually like 4K native, for example. This is probably going to be 512 for most people, I'd assume. The IO alignment is for the specific media or partition, and that is usually like four or eight or some low power of two number, just in case you have to align something for a, a buffer that you read data to or from, you'd want to make sure it's aligned to this value. Uh, for, for a lot of things, for partitions, this is probably going to be zero and it won't really matter, but sometimes it might. Uh, the last block determines how big the overall thing is. The lowest aligned LBA, uh, sort of a range, <laughs> if you get a range between this lowest aligned LBA and the last block value, then you'll get the overall size of this particular media, which is probably just a partition, unless the flag is false, then you can assume it's probably going to be the whole drive. So if you have a 512 byte block size, then that many blocks multiplied by this value, the last block determines sort of how big the partition is, and you can get the size from that. Um, blocks per physical block, I've never really seen this filled out yet. And I don't remember what that is. <laughs> I'm assuming if you have something like an internal 4K native drive, this would be eight, for example. It'd be the number of blocks that, uh, that comprise one physical block on the device, but I'm not absolutely sure. That is kind of what it says. It does not contain an exponential value. Whatever that means, it's usually zero, so it's one for one. Um, and if the partition is true, then it is zero. Okay, so for, for partitions, you don't really have to worry about it. Transfer length granularity, I, I haven't seen either. I haven't seen a value that isn't zero, but I'm assuming that would be the minimum number of blocks. Yeah, the minimum number of logical blocks, or just not the minimum, but um, the number to transfer at once for a read or write operation to be more efficient. So maybe eight 512 byte blocks at once would be more efficient for a 4K drive, for example.
but I'm still, I'm just guessing. <laughs> I don't write storage drivers, so I don't know. If logical partition is true, it's for a partition. For media with only one partition, it will always be true. So it's kind of hard to get the full disk in that situation. But if you know what you're looking for, then it should make sense. Whether or not the one partition is for the whole device or for a subset of that device. Uh, we'll have one of these block I.O. protocols and the media structs therein for each partition on the thing and for the device itself. So for this disk image, I have an EFI system partition and a data partition. So I would get a block I.O. protocol for each and each one would have different values in this media struct. And you could tell by the last block size and also by the, the, the data for the partition. If we use a partition info protocol, we can also tell which type it is as well, like a system partition or a data partition or something else, a swap partition and ext4 for Linux, whatever, Windows specific ones, for example. But it's pretty simple overall. It's got res reset, read, write, and flush. So read and write mainly. You just give it an OBA. You have to get the block IO protocol to get the media ID. You give it the starting OBA or block address on the device. You give it a buffer size, which for block IO needs to be a multiple of the block size of the device. Yeah, multiple of the intrinsic size, so it's 512. Then you should make sure the buffer is a multiple of 512. And then a pointer to that. Same thing for write. It would just be in the other direction. And flush would be, I'm assuming only if the write caching flag is true, you'd probably need to use flush to write and actually flush the data to the device. That's all that's really there. The two sort of suffix protocols are, they give you IO tokens, so you can set up a, a priority list or a task list or something. You can listen for it later and do asynchronous, asynchronous processing there. So just say, okay, write this two gigs of data and come back to me when you're done. You could probably use it for that, but I'm not going to be looking into that. I'm just going to be doing blocking IO with block IO. But disk IO is a little bit easier if you want to use that instead. So disk IO is the same as block IO pretty much, except it gives you only read and write. It's a simpler abstraction over it. So if you open a block IO protocol, you should also be able to open disk IO protocol on the same handle, we'll say. And disk IO is a byte granularity, not block. So instead of making sure the buffer is a multiple of the block size, you can use disk IO for however big you want, and the firmware will convert that to a multiple of the block size and handle that for you. And it'll also handle flushing. So if you have outstanding write buffer data, it's going to be flushed with flush blocks from block IO. And that's okay. So you don't have to worry about that either. So this guy is a little easier to use, which is nice. So I'll probably be using that just because it, it seems to be easier in general. But block and disk IO should automatically be generated for the FAT file system. So the EFI system partition, your master boot record, your MBR, and usually any other GPT partitions as well. But the, the things for that look pretty similar to block IO, except we don't have an LBA value. We have an offset and a buffer size in bytes. So it's just the byte offset of the block device. So instead of getting like the fifth block on the device, you might have, if you want to use blocks, you could convert that to bytes and just say, okay, if we have a file at LBA 1000, you would just multiply that by the block size of the device. Yeah, of the device that would give you the offset. And you can use that, for example if you had to convert in between, or you just know something's at byte 76543 or something. But read and write are pretty simple. You don't have to do flush or reset. So those aren't too bad. And the two is asynchronous with an IO token. So other than that, I'll probably use partition info just so I can, let's say, print info on the screen for a partition that we find. And it could be like an MBR, it could be a GPT partition, it could be something else. So the partition info protocol, which should you should be able to open this on the same handle, we'll say, that you can open a block I.O. protocol or a disk I.O. protocol on. You should get a partition info for a partition. So if the logical partition flag is true and the disk I in the block I.O. media <laughs> value that's returned, if the that flag is true, you should be able to get partition info on that. And from there you can determine if we're looking at an MBR or GPT or something that's not recognized. They give you a couple flags there for the type field in here. Other than that, there is a system flag, and if system is one, then it's a system partition. Else you'll have to look at the data pretty much <laughs> to determine kind of what it is. You'll have to look at this flag. So if we get a partition type GPT, and we have something that's for our disk image, 
then we can look at the union here info. We can look at the GPT info for the partition type GUID and say, okay, since the EFI system partition and data partition and things have hard-coded GUID values, we can just like mem compare against those. So that, that won't be too hard. But that's maybe all I'm going to be doing this video, depending how far we get. <laughs> I'm just going to probably add another menu option for printing info out. And depending how far I get, that might be it. But if it doesn't take that long, then I'll also just read a file from the data partition. So that won't be too bad. Uh, but I'm going to add these protocols to the EFI.h file. I just don't want to, you know, film myself copying and pasting code for 10 minutes. But <laughs> I'm going to add the block IO, disk IO, and partition info protocols. And I'll be back when that's done. All right, so I copied over the disk IO and the block IO and the partition info, not IO, <laughs> protocols over to my header file here. I just put them after the simple file system stuff. So I just want to show that I did physically, you know, copy and paste the things here for all the block IO things and the disk IO things. And the partition info, which the partition info did need a few other definitions for MBR and GPT, and those are in chapter five of the spec. So I did not show that, but chapter five, I kind of went over in earlier videos in the playlist for making the disk image tool, the disk image writer, we'll say, but it's a pretty short chapter. It just goes over the, the MBR structs and the GP, the GPT partition entry stuff. So I just added those, but they are physically in the spec. Yeah, at these locations and they have pragma pack. So I put an attribute packed just to emulate that because they're packed on a one byte boundary, which I wish C compilers did by default, but you have to tell it to do that. So, oh, well, that's kind of the only difference there. And those are needed for the MVR and, and GPT portions of this union and the partition info protocol. So that was the only extra thing that I kind of left out. Uh, and, and again, for these, for disk and block IO, I had to type def destruct as itself because the functions refer to those protocols and they're defined within the overall protocol itself. That refers to the functions that refer to the protocol. So I had to put that first to fix, you know, compilation errors there. But that's all right. So I should be able to hopefully, I mean, I'm not using it, but I should be able to at least compile and it does compile and work. So that's good. I'm not using it yet, of course, but that's all right. Uh, one thing I haven't done is, in a while is test out Clang, so I may have issues because I think GCC, or at least this cross compiler for GCC, has stuff for, well, if I do a make clean, I think it has stuff for mem copy and mem set, and Clang does not, but I guess I'm not using it yet, so that's okay. <laughs> I have run into issues on that before, so I guess I'll do that when I come to it. Uh, as well as Clang needed this int for floating point, but anyway, I'm going to add another menu option for this stuff here. So I put it here. I probably should put it outside the loop, really. That would make more sense. So it's not, you know, on the stack in the loop, just in case it's probably compiled and optimized out anyway, but that's fine. I'll just add another option here for, let's say, print, um, I don't know, block IO partitions, print block device. I'll just print, I'll do print block IO partitions. That kind of makes somewhat sense here. I'll just call, call this the same thing so that I know what function it goes to. And I'll just put it, I don't know, above this point. That's fine. I'll say using block IO protocol and probably block IO and partition info, we'll say. That's fine. So print block IO partitions. We'll say we don't take in anything. That's all right. We'll return a status by default. I'll just return success. So I'll just put a stub there and I'll probably clear the screen as well just to start off and I'll get a key just to prove that we actually go into it. I think it's called clear screen. Yeah. All right, so I'll clear, let's just say, say I print here so that I know I'm here or I'll print testing, that'll be all right. Okay, 
So here it finally, yeah, that's what I was looking for earlier. I get an LLD link error with Clang that says undefined symbol mem copy and EFI main. So I suppose past a certain point, or depending how it compiles, like this stuff or this stuff, it should put them in a BSS section or, or read only memory or where, where have you when it's linked in. But it says, hey, I need mem copy to set this up from the compiler. So I guess the cross compile GCC has its own built ins or another way of compiling that Clang doesn't. I don't really know. But we need a mem copy set up. And sometimes you need a mem set for stuff like this if it's not zero. Maybe we'll need a mem set if it's not FF or something. Initialization of sub object. Uh, missing green initializer. I don't know. Anyway, sometimes it can come up where you also need mem set. So I'll probably make both and I'll just put them at the top here as extra. We'll say helper functions. That'll be fine. I'll say mem set for compiling with Clanger GCC just in case. And it should return, was it return the dest buffer, I think? I don't remember. I'll just put that there. It'll return, it'll return S. I mean, I could keep the things with this, but I guess I'll, I'll do the UE5 versions here. I'll say returns dist buffer. So what does memset do? So we will set in in bytes of dest memory with int c. I don't really like n though. Let's say length. Just to be a little bit better there. Instead of size t, I mean we should have size t, but let's say you went in just for sake of argument here. So it's probably, this is going to be worse than, you know, my host libc version, but that's fine. I'll just do a basic thing here. Instead of int c, I'll do int, int n, I guess, or int 32 would be the regular int. So let's say 32. It's not really great, though. Since it's really only going to be a byte of memory, I might just make it a uint 8. That's the first n bytes of memory with the constant byte c. So it's supposed to just be a byte. So yeah, I'll just set, I'll set that there. So not, not a great function here, but that's all right. So let's just say for i equals zero, i less than length, i plus plus. We'll just have a loop to fill in these bytes here. And I could fill it out with dest, or I could have another pointer. It's fine. We'll just have a un8 pointer to dest here. We'll cast it. And for each byte of that, we can just offset from there. So pi will equal c, and that should be simple enough. Then we'll just return the final buffer at the end anyway, and the memory should be set from that. So if I do that, it says undefined symbol mem copy, not mem set. So I'll have to fill out mem copy as well. And that's pretty easy. So it sets length bytes of desk memory with length bytes. Uh, I'll say from source. And returns dest. Okay. So we'll have dest and source. Which I think is how these things work. I'll just make sure. Void dest source size tn. Copies n bytes from source to memory area dest. They must not overlap. So I don't have a mem move. So I'm assuming these don't overlap. Okay, so mem copy would be pretty similar. I'll just set, let's say, p and q to source and dest, and we'll just set those equal to each other. So pi equals qi. Just instead of setting the byte from the input byte, I'll just set it from the other buffer. That's simple enough. And then return dest, and that should be, I think, all I need for a mem copy. It's pretty simple. Okay, and then it compiles all right. It says, hey, I don't care. And we have print block IO right now. It's not going to do anything, but say testing. So that's okay. And if I want to make sure, I can also check with the make file by just recompiling with GCC. And it says it does not like mem copy. We have conflicting types because it gets that from uchar.h. It includes its own within wchar. I hate wchar. Why are you including that? <laughs> 
because I'm doing that. So I have to take that out, I guess. Okay. Annoying, but that's all right. Just kind of quit out of that because I already had something open. Okay. So the reason I'm doing this to begin with is for clang and for other things. But the reason is to get a char 16 T type, which is from the standard as far as I can tell. Defined is this type def, so maybe I'll just do that by default. And I'll take this out because I'm not using any other thing than basically that type def from the uchar.h. I'm not using, you know, member to see or whatever the things are for converting multi byte stuff. So, okay. I'll just take that out, which is not, uh, not great, but that's all right. It seems to work. I just want to make sure it compiles with both right now, and I'll try to make sure to compile with both going forward, at least off camera for testing. Because I want to make sure it works with, you know, both of these compilers, but that seems to be all right. I can still read through stuff just as a test. I can read through files. Okay. All right, so let's actually fill out the data stuff. So it was print data, no, block IO, block IO partitions. Okay. So testing, let's say we'll have, press any key to go back. So the user will see that and they'll know at the end they can press any key to go back and it'll return and we'll be all right. Okay. So how do we get the block IO? It's not available from the boot or runtime services. We'll have to do something like locate handle buffer which I will grab that kind of stuff wherever I used it. Let's do that. All right, so I just copied that for my code here. Except I'll have different protocols and things, of course. Just return status maybe at the end. We define it to there. Yeah, I'll still return that, that's okay. But this way I can have a status thing here. So I want to do by protocol, I'll have different GUID values and stuff, so let's have that. Instead of simple pointer protocol, I want block IO protocol. So block IO, oh. Let's open, just open that so that I have it in the buffer here. So I can search for it, all right. Let's have block IO GUID, we'll equal that, and I'll have Block IO protocol. I'll just call it, I guess I'm ending things with a P for protocol, so I'll call it biop. I'll do a, a pointer for that, so we can pass a pointer to locate handle buffer. So block IO GUID. We need a num handles, which I believe is uint n. And we need a buffer for that, which is a handle array that it's going to fill out. So I'll just call it handle buffer, handle buff. And that should still work here. So I want to open every block IO protocol, because I give it that GUID, every one that's going to be found on our system from on the system from the firmware, it's going to fill out the number and the handle buffer with that. So I could not locate any block IO protocols. And I'll return that status. I was also I did give some thought over the past few days of how to do better error reporting and printing. So I don't have like an error function or anything, but you can pass a variable, how do I want to say this? A variable args, VA args, you know, you have a VA list parameter. You can pass that as a type to a function. So you can have a wrapper function around error printing if you want. And I think I'm going to do that for eprintf because a lot of the time when I print an error from this, uh, for my other function, for example, the one I did on the last video, I would print an error and I'd get a key, so I can automatically get a key within an error function. So I can save some lines of code there, and I can say I have an overall function for errors um, that'll get a key so that it doesn't go on immediately in case I forget to put that sometimes. So I'm gonna have an overall error function because I wanted to do that as well, just to be fancy with it. So after eprintf maybe, I'll have an error function. So let's say, so print error, message and get a key from user. I'll say so they can acknowledge the error and it doesn't go on immediately. I think that makes sense. 
So of course with these videos, I'm kind of winging it. So it's not really having to do with block IO right now. Just adding other things, but that's okay. So what I do for eprintf, I just called it a Boolean. Okay, I guess I'll have a Boolean for there for that. So that'll be a wrapper. So I'll take in what eprintf is. And I'll do the similar VA list and VA end. We'll just call it args and start and end. And I'll get it from format, but in between here, I'm going to call eprintf, and I'm going to change the signature of that. And I'll pass it just args, really. I don't have to pass it. Well, I can pass it format. Yeah, so it'll know, and it'll get it from that list. So I can just wrap it, call it with that, and then I can pass it a VA list as the type. And I need the end as well in this function. We'll just return true here. Or, well, I can do full result from eprintf, and I can return that, which can be true or false. So that'll just propagate that. Just say what that does. Print the error out in the variable args. Okay, so eprintf up here. Instead of the ellipses, I can just say it's going to be a VA list, and I'm going to call it args. That's fine. And we're not handling, we're passing in the args, so we can get rid of that. We're doing start within the wrapper function. And VA end is in the wrapper as well. So we can just do that. Simplify it slightly. I don't think anything else has to be done. I just wanted to get a key. Uh, user will respond with inputs before going on. Okay, so that was the whole reason to do that. So everywhere where I have eprintf, I'll have to change it to just an error call, but it might make a little more sense. But I thought that was interesting that, yeah, VA list is a type, you can pass it in as a type to a function. And then in some of these cases before, we'd print an error but go on immediately. Now we'll have to have input before going on, which I think is a little bit better in some situations. So I'm just gonna copy paste and Change all the uses of eprintf to error here, which I think is all right. Oh. And then in these other places where I was doing get key, that's now implicit to the error function, so I can get rid of the get key uses now. So I guess I'm not going to say it's going to reduce lines of code. But at least at runtime, it'll look slightly cleaner. And then we can get the error and get a key before going on in all situations. So I don't know. Maybe that's not better. <laughs> but I figured it'd be a little better and make runtime error cleanup slightly more streamlined from the get key uses at least. Here, we don't need get key. Okay, so then I only have those uses. So then in case I miss stuff going backwards, I don't think so. Okay. That should be all I need to do there. Let me just make sure it compiles. It does not, because that needs to be after get key, because it doesn't know where that's it, where that is, what that is. <laughs> I don't have things being forward declared right now. I have to do it after here. That way it knows where the get key function is and what it's all about. Okay, so I'm not using block error protocol, that's all right. I'm not really going to have errors here. But in the future, if I do get any, then that'll get a key from the user now, so that's okay. All right, so back in this function, actually print block IO after that digression. We've gotten the block IO protocol, so let's go, I'll say, loop through and print partition. I'll say all. Partition info found. Partition information. I guess that's plural. Anyway, maybe that's not right grammar. That's okay. So I'll go through all of those. Let's say we go through num handles because it would return those. So for each one of these handles in the handle buffer, it should be available to have block IO protocol. So we can call open protocol on that, which I'll just copy something I had before. Because I don't remember the parameters that go into that. But yes, we'll have a handle buffer. That'll be offset by I in this case. We'll use the block IO protocol GUID. Open block IO on that. We'll put that data into 
the block editor protocol itself, which is a pointer, so it'll be a double pointer. Yeah, so we'll cast the address of that pointer, that's all right. Uh, the image that this is in, and this is a global image handler for the, or the global image handle for this whole EFI image, this application. And we'll open it by a handle protocol. Okay, if that failed, we'll say could not open block.io protocol on handle, and I guess we'll continue with that. That's all right. Say on handle percent u, that's okay. Yeah, so I have status and I. Okay, but if we could open it, then I will want to close it as well. So we'll close it when done. And I don't remember the stuff for that either. We'll just copy that. It's not the loaded image protocol. This is just going to be on the image handle because it was opened on the image handle. Well, it was open for the handle buffer, rather. Let's do that. That's the handle it was opened on. It's going to be the block IO protocol, GUID, or just block IO GUID for the image. And then this is the controlling handle or something. Yeah, I won't have that. Okay. So what do I do now that I have an open protocol? I want to probably print the info for that, which will be the media info. So let's do that. Print block IO media info for this disk slash partition, because it could be either really. We have a bunch of stuff in that sort of media section. So all these values, I won't necessarily care about all of these, but they're all available if we want them, assuming the revision is high enough, of course. So media ID, we're going to get multiple values per media ID. So that this will be sort of static for each, um, for each disk, each device we're looking at. So we can have several of these block IO protocols for one media ID, which represents every partition for that given media. So for that disk, for example, or this disk image, we'd have multiple partitions on the disk image, but they would all have the same media ID. So I could kind of print that as a header and then only change when we're done with it. And then I can also differentiate what, what our disk image is and what isn't our disk image by looking at that media ID as well. So that would probably be good info to see in case we want to take from this disk image or from, from another disk. We kind of want to know what the differences are. That's one way to look at it. So let me actually do that. I guess I'll do that here maybe. So let's get uh, get media. ID for this disk image first to compare to others and output because that would probably be useful info. And it's not so you went 32, so let's say I'll say this image media ID. And we'll say we could either save the block IO protocol or just just the number probably be alright. So I'm, I'm going to have the loaded image protocol in order to get a device handle for this loaded image in order to open the block IO protocol on that. So it'll be kind of duplicating what this is doing for all the block IOs, but just for the loaded image. And I'll just get that first. And it would also be included in this array. But just to compare and get it first, that's probably all right. However, it was called loaded image. Is it not called that? Let's just grab that. So I'll get the loaded image protocol here. And then I can call open protocol on that. Before locate handle buffer. Yeah, I'll do that. So instead of the handle buffer here at this point, we would have gotten the loaded image protocol within here. So we can call loaded image protocol device handle. Opening the block IO protocol, we'll put it into there. Assuming that worked. If that didn't work, I'd say could not open block IO protocol for this uh, loaded image. Yeah, I'll just say that. Okay, if we did. And I can grab the media ID 
actually, I don't need that until this point. This would equal the block IO protocol, that's a pointer, so I'd offset to get the, or I'd dereference to get the media, which is a pointer from the definition. And I'd grab the media ID, yep. Okay. Which could be a constant, I guess, but that's all right. Okay, so there is, <laughs> I always forget until I come back to this. If I do, you know, error handling after this, and then I do write the functions top down like this, it's kind of a lot of boilerplate, but it's not too bad. It's pretty simple overall. I'll say media ID for this running disk image itself. All right, because then we can print stuff down where I'm getting the info on screen. Oh, let's say we have a last one too. Yeah. Let's say when I switch the disk or when the media ID changes, I'll just print a little header so I don't print it out for every single partition. We can use less lines of code like that. List lines of code on screen is output, and that is. So I'll say last media ID zero. Sometimes, or I think maybe always, it'll start at zero. I don't think they'll start or go to a super high number anytime soon, especially not four billion. So I'll set it to something like negative one, and that would be easier to detect changes for this value. And it should go as well as the first one. It would correspond to that. So if we say last media ID is not equal to the current one, and I can print out a little header that says, you know, new disk or something. So if this is not equal to the current one we're on, which is going to be opened inside of this block IO protocol, and I just realized I have it open. So let me close it. I'm going a little back and forth. Sorry about that. <laughs> After I get the ID here, I want to close it, or else we can have multiple opens for it. That might cause issues. But that's on the loaded image protocol device handle. Okay, just make sure I close that because I opened it here. And I also opened the loaded image protocol as well. So I'll say open. We'll close that on the image handle itself, the global one. And this will be loaded image protocol GUID. Okay. All right, I'll put this here as a delineator. All right, we have a last ID. Keep track of currently, uh, currently opened media info. All right, so it doesn't equal the current one. Should be offsetting these pointers. Then I'll just print a little thing here. I'll say ID or media. Yeah, media ID is fine. Say media ID percent U. I can have percent S instead. If it's the current one, I can print a little thing that says, or well, if, if the media is the disk image we're looking at, I just want to print that out as a label here just to differentiate from other things that might be there, like on a real machine. So I'm just going to print a string after the media ID. And this would be, well, I'd set it, last media ID equals... equals this media ID, and I'll just print that. And we can say, I'll do this. If that equals the current one, which is going to be whatever I called it, I think this image, yeah, this image media ID, if it equals that, then I'll print disk image as a little label there. Else I'll just print nothing, and that'll be all right. Yeah. Okay, so that'll be... I'll just do a ternary to take up less space. We'll print this, or, or we'll print that. And it does not... This needs to be a colon, sorry. <laughs> this needs to be a colon. It's not that way for parameters. All right. I will wrap that in just to make, like, an expression, though. I'll wrap that in parentheses. Don't need to, but that's okay. Helps me see it better. Yeah, so yeah, set the new one. That's just like header info, and then I'll print the actual info here. Let's print that on the next line. So what do I want to print out? We'll have the media ID. I could do removable, and I'm not going to print out the full words here, because by default we'll have an 80 by 25 text screen, and that's not going to fit on there. <laughs> 25, it'll fit on longer lines, but... 
I might uh, use a lot of abbreviations here, which is not going to be great. So that's okay. For these Booleans, I'm just going to print a Y or an N for yes or no. For the other ones, I'll print the, the numeric values. The LBA is a UN64, so that'll just be a numeric value as well. So I'll just say a removable, we'll say present, maybe PR, if it's actually there. Logical partition, I'll say logical. Uh, logical part, we'll say read only, read only. We'll have write cache in, we'll say write cache for the dollar sign to be similar to some other concepts in comp sci. They like to be funny with that. Okay, so that'll be those. And I'll have the block size. So I'll do block size. Just as an unsigned value, we'll do alignment. I guess IO align. Or am I doing G? I guess that makes sense. We'll have the last block. And the lowest aligned LBA, I'll say low LBA. And logical blocks per physical block. I'll see, how much is this? 43, so that'll probably be, what's well, 80? I just wanna make sure I have less than 80 per line. That'll be all right. I'll have logical block per physical. And maybe I'll just print the other ones on the next line. Optimal transfer length granularity. I don't think I'll use this, but I'll just put it here just to print it out. Just to have it on screen, but I might remove that. But for all these, this is just going to be basically these values here. So I'll just do biop media and we'll dereference to get those. And let's Convert semicolon to comma, okay, except for the last one here. Okay, I think that'll be all right. And then we'll close it when we're done. So we'll see what that looks like. I suppose between the partitions, I just want to see what this looks like so far. Let's say print type of partition, e.g. ESP or data or other. And I'll separate them out with a couple new lines. Just so physically they look different. Or, well, visually, they look different. Okay. So, biop GUID is BIO. I didn't do that correctly. This one is... I think I called that right. Oh, just the GUID value. Oh, uh, 544. Let's see wherever I have that. That's the only place, okay. Doesn't like me doing that, so I need a comma. Is that good? Okay. So I also got this. This is bad because this needs a U on it to be U16, even though it's just a null value. Forgot that U there. All right, that should be the issues done, done and dealt with. So what do we have for these so far? Media ID zero, so we have the disk image itself is the only thing that's found, and I wasn't printing any strings for the yes or no values, I just realized. <laughs> that's what it looks like when you mess up, even though the compiler doesn't tell you that. Oh well. So these are Booleans, the first uh, up until block size value. So what I can do for these is set a question mark, and if it's correct, we'll just print a Y. If it's incorrect or it's false, I'll just print a no. So I'll just do that. And um, I think I'll go to the end of the line. I guess I'll go to the end and go there and then quit. I tried to make a little yeah macro for that. That worked out well. That was good. Trying to be faster over time with Vim and stuff. Sometimes it's not, it doesn't work out, but sometimes it does. 
Okay, so I should have yes or no value. So the first one is removable. It is present. All of these should be, well, I guess some aren't present. Logical partition, no, should be the whole disk. Some of them are read-only, some aren't. Interesting. So the second one here is also for the disk, but its block size is 2048, and it has a last block of zero. That may correspond to the MBR, it may not, I'm not sure. I could look at partition info to be sure, but I'm going to say for the sake of argument and printing this out, if you want to see it, that's fine, but I'm not going to print anything that has a last block of zero, because that means it only really has one block of data. And for everything that I'm going to look at, I'm only interested in stuff that has more than 512 bytes. So that probably is the MBR, but let's say I'm not interested in the MBR. I can um, not look at that, or maybe I am interested. I'm trying to think. Well, let's see what comes out of it. I would say doing this in the past, I would not be interested, but let's say we can print out the type and see if it's an MBR or not. I could also do this first before this stuff. I may change to do that. Right now, I'll just print a separate label at the bottom that says like ESP or data or something. So let's see, we have to look at the partition info. So if it is a logical partition, then I want to print that. If it's not, I don't. So let's see. Just to make sure, it has logical partition, no. So they would both say it's for the full disk. But actually, yeah, let me, let me just ignore that because I don't really care about it as far as printing it out here. So let me just do that. I'll say if, what do I want to do? If, if the media logical part, not, not logical partition, last block. If, <laughs> if the last block is zero, then I don't really care to print it out. So I'll say if it's greater than zero, then I'll print out the info here. Yeah, I'll just do that. Only really care about partitions, disk, above one block in size. That's okay. Okay, it'll close it regardless, and we'll print this at the end, I suppose. Yeah. Separate visually. Separate each block visually. Okay. Each block of text, I guess, would make more sense there. So partition info. I'll just print at the end here. So let's say if. Uh, this one I'll do logical partition. So if logical partition is no, or if it's false. I'll just print out a value that says entire disk, because I'm assuming it's going to be for the whole device here. So I'll say ent entire disk is going to be, if it's not a partition, if it is a partition, then by definition it's a subset of the disk, even if it's the full thing. So let's say I'll print it in brackets or something like that. Uh, maybe I'll do it like this. I'll have the entire disk here. Else if we don't have the disk, but it is a partition, we'll know we have that. So let's say we can open partition info on it. I'll do that. Partition info protocol for this partition. So that would also be open protocol. <laughs> it would be on this handle buffer, same as the other. Instead of block IO, I'll do partition info. It's partition info GUID. Call it partition info GUID. And I'll have the pointer as well. Is it just protocol? Yeah, protocol. So PIO or partition info protocol, say PIP, I guess. Open it on this image. Yep, on this handle buffer. Okay. So if error. So could not open. 
partition info protocol on handle. Um, I want to go like here if that doesn't happen. So I guess I'll say else here. Just do it. Do some nested if elses. Everyone loves the triangles of doom. Those are always fun. So let's check what partition we got. I don't remember what that looks like off the top of my head. It's down here somewhere. Yeah, the MBR and the GPTs. Okay. So we'll have a partition info protocol. We'll have a struct or we'll have a pointer, a pointer to a struct with this info in it. So I can, I can look at that. So if system is one, I know it's an EFI system partition, for example, or I know if it's an EFI, um, I know if it's an MBR or something else according to the type as well. So let's just look at that. So I'll say if our partition info protocol will have type, if the type equals um, whatever it was, partition type. So it's just partition type, not EFI. We'll say if it's NBR, I'll print NBR. If it's not, I'll print something else. Do that. Um, yeah, I can do it like this. So if it's that, say else if. If it's MBR, if it's GPT, I can print GPT and what type it is, or it's other. I could do that first, I guess. If it's other, I'll just print other type. If it's an MBR, print MBR. If it's GPT, I'll print something else depending on what GPT type it is, because I know of the EFI system partition and the basic data, those are the only two I know of at the moment and whatever stuff that I'm working with. And we would look at the partition entry. If it's a GPT, we'd look at the partition type, GUID. So that's what I'll do, depending on what it is. So if it's a partition type, I'll have some more triangles of dune down here. <laughs> I could switch on the type, I guess, as well. But. So how do I tell? I can't just do an equal. I'll have to do like a mem compare with a, a full. So I'd have to say if the pip the reference to partition entry, which is going to be within this union. So it would be info. Well, I can tell if it's a system type if system is one. So I guess right. I could check that by default. So be. ESP or EFI system partition. Okay. Oh, so I might refactor this later because I don't like having, you know, this isn't bad, but sometimes I get to where it's like five levels of indentation. I don't like that, but anyway, this isn't bad right now. If it's not a system partition, what type is it? I'll just, we need something to compare to. So compare GPT dot whatever it is partition type with known values. So I don't think I have that copied for my disk image, so I need to go ahead and do that. So my GUIDs, I just copied, you know, these up here from earlier. So let me copy that for my disk partition, which is in, or my disk image creator, which is here. Yeah, basic data and EFI. I'm just going to copy these over here. Okay. And I'll make these defines like the others. So I guess I'll still call it that. ESP, GUID, and the other. One, two, three, four, one, two, one, two. And then I did this. Yeah, and then I did this. Okay. I have Microsoft's basic data GYD. These are the only two I really know about. So we could mem copy against this as well to check, but if this is, if system is set to one, we don't need to do that, so that's okay.
Get rid of that and put it there. Okay. These are partition type GUIDs. Let's just say if we put them here. All right. I would say we compare. So let's say if not, and then compare because it would return zero. I don't think I have this function yet either, so I'll have to write this in a second, but that's okay. So if not compare, pip, the union is called info, and then it would be GPT within that struct. And these aren't pointers, so I'll use dot partition type GUID. So if I need that, it needs to be an address because it would be mcopy takes void pointers. And the basic data GUID, so I need that. Say, I'll just say basic data GUID. But that's the same name. Uh, name mangling wouldn't be great. I don't like that. Uh, okay, I'll just say data, data GUID, just so they have different. I don't think name mangling really matters here, but as far as messing up, but just in case. Then I'll do a printf. Okay. So I'll print basic data. Okay, else I don't know what it is, so I guess I'll print like the other type here. I didn't have a new line there. All right. I'll just say other, I'll say other GPT type. That's fine. Okay. Just for visual indicators here, that's all right. And you could add more types here or other, you know, other code here to print this out if you cared. I'm just trying to give not even a holistic view, just some sort of view into the stuff. So, okay. Mem set, mem copy. I'll put below this for a mem compare. Their length bytes of, uh, let's just say memory memory values. Let's say I call them M1 and M2. Stop at, say, up to. So up to length bytes of M1 and M2. Stop at first point that they don't equal. It'll be an n, an int, I'll say int n. And it will return zero if equal, greater than zero if m1 is greater than m2, less than zero if m2 is greater than m1. Okay. Not great, but that's all right. So mem compare would be, I'll just say these two. You went to in length. I'll grab pointers to those. That's fine. I up the length. So it's like if they don't equal. Well, we could do it a few different ways. We'll say if length equals zero, return zero because it doesn't matter. They're gonna they're gonna equal. Well, they, they might not, actually. Yeah, okay, I can do it like this. For, for up to the length, compare each byte. If the byte doesn't equal, then we'll just return the, yeah, the difference in those. P1 minus P2. I guess those aren't int values, though. If they are all equal, return zero. So that's fine. So this value would be, I'll have to cast them, probably. Because I'm just comparing bytes. So that'd be uint8. Yeah, I'll cast it to an int. Okay. Because that's what it wants. I think that's reasonable. Too few arguments. Expected 3 out of 2 because I need the length. That's true. Let me just see as a comparison. That takes an int with void pointers and a size. First n bytes as unsigned char. Okay. Non-zero value signs from my sign the difference if it's zero zero. Yeah, I think that's that's all right. And the length would be the size of. I think I can use size of here. It'd be sixteen, but it's the size of a GUID. 
which I need another thing. Okay. All right, that compiles so far. What do we have here? I don't have anything for the disk image, which is interesting. Oh, it's the entire disk. <laughs> I printed it twice, which is great because the one I'm not printing for the last block value being zero. But if you just take the first one in the list, other than the bad print values, uh, I'm not printing these very well, am I? Kind of printed at a line after where I wanted it. But the top one is the whole disk. It has the largest last block value. The second one is the EFI system partition. The third one is the data partition, which matches up because the block size of 512, last block 2048, 2048 times 512 is one meg, which is the minimum and the only size right now for my data partition. So I know that's pretty much correct. But it did not print everything. Oh, I'm not including that arrow there anyway. That would be why. Okay, so I want to, oh, I want to print the new lines after each, each block, really. Yeah. Let me do that and close it when done. Did I print it out? Nope. Okay, that'll be a little bit better. Not much, but I just want the print the printouts to be slightly better. They're not. I don't know what I'm doing. Terrible stuff. I can actually print a new line at the end of this, and that would be. A little better as well. If last block is greater than zero, I suppose if it equals zero, I can just do continue and I don't really care. But I do want to close, but I don't want to print this. Um, okay, let's do this. This is not a great way of doing it, but it's it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Let's do this, and we'll say, if it is zero, we'll just close it early and do continue. Okay, that's what I wanted. <laughs> so I can get rid of both new lines between because that's a little more space, but you can see here, it looks a little bit better. For the disk image, we have these partitions the whole disk and the system partition basic data. I could probably move that to print first. It might look a little better visually to print the partition type. But that kind of gives an indication of what we're working with for the disk image, at least. On a real machine, you'd have different ones, probably more. So on my laptop, I can show that as a picture or a little clip or something, and we'd show that. But this is basically, you know, just printing the partition info here. It's not, not too bad. Let's say I just print one line. One line probably will look a little bit better. Yeah, one line looks slightly better. So that's how you print partition info. That's That might be all I do on this one to keep it shorter. So I can have sort of a few more videos out. But maybe maybe for the next one, yeah, for the next video, I'll just I'll add another menu option here. And I'll read files from the data partition, which won't be that bad since I made the, the disk image tool. Um, and what that does is add files. If I add a file to the data partition, that will add a file to the EFI system partition containing metadata about that file. So the name of the file, how large it is in bytes, and where it is at on the disk image itself, not necessarily within the data partition, but as an offset. So as an example, what I can do is say, um, I can add it to the make file, or I'll just add something here. I may add a, a thing to the make file, but let's say we have testing, and that'll be eight characters, for example, and I'll add it to a file, test.txt, right? So I have this file, I'll add it to the data partition in my disk image. So I'll just copy that into here. And we can either do it within the make file or manually. But I have a flag, which if I want to see the flags, I've helped. So I can add a file with AD or add data files, and I need to pass a path, and it will. It should take the file from that path and add it to the data partition. If I have something in here, like the test.txt, it'll add that. And if we have a kernel.bin, for example, in the future, then I can add multiple things at once. Right now, I'll just add this file to the first position in the data partition. So what I get is another line, and it says I added this file from this path and my host to the data partition. And to contain info about where it is, 
I added this file, data fls for data files .inf. It's not really the inf standard. I just called it that for info. I'm only using short directory names <laughs> or short directory entries for the name for the fat file system. So it has to fit within 8.3. Otherwise I'd do a better name. But anyway, that makes a local file data files inf, which contains this info, and that info is also within the uh, within the file system. So I can read it as the EFI files. I put it in EFI boot along with the other disk image info file. So I have stuff that says how big the disk image is and what files are in the data partition. And I'm not converting slash n to slash r slash n. So it, since, it, since my host is only slash n line endings, it prints stair step, which is not great. I can handle that when I'm printing, though. So let me actually do that. Before I end this video, got to fix some bugs, you know, not much, but some, some bugs. I'm printing this at the bottom. Yeah, print content here. So in here, I'll say if this is just a, a new line, I'll convert it. Um, yeah, I probably can do this first anyway. That's fine. I'll just add an else case here. So if we don't print the character, well, we'll print the character. Else we'll print something else. I'll just print a slash r slash n for a new line. So I'll just say convert, uh, let's say Linux, new line to CRLF, or convert LF to CRLF. Okay, so it prints out a little bit better. Okay, of course that won't convert CRLF to CRLF, it'll print extras. Or I can just say if it's R, print both. Eh, right now I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> I'm assuming we'll find a new line, so it'll be R and then RN, which, yeah, that's fine. That won't really do anything visually. If we already have CRLF, it should end up the same, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so in this, I guess I don't have that because I don't have it in the make file. Let me just keep making mistakes. Let's say right now I'll have a test file, and I'll just add that into here. And eventually I can change this from a text file to like a kernel that we load, so this might be good anyway to have it here. So for the test file, doesn't need to depend on anything, but if it's not made yet, I'll let go testing into there, and I'll just copy that into there. Okay, and then when I'm sure those are made, we have the disk image program, which is going to be the right, right GPT. So I'll just add the flag to that. So dash a d test file. And that should add it to the disk image every single time this is ran. And by making it, it'll just echo it into a local file. Okay. Uh, there we go. So we have it there. And then it still adds it there. Okay. So now I should have it in here. There we go. And I'm converting correctly the line endings so it looks better. <laughs> so we have the file name, we have where it's at, we have the disk LVA. So what I can do is get the loaded image protocol. I can open a pointer to the root directory and either go into this folder or just read it from the root directory given a, a relative path or an absolute path from root. And I can read this file, this data files.inf file. I can parse it out. Maybe I'll make a couple helper functions for like string string or something for find substring and A2I or whatever to convert to a number. And this is UNT8 or UTF-8 text, ASCII text. This isn't UTF-16, so I might need conversions there. But uh, other than that, we can read this file, parse out the data, and then we have a disk LBA, the absolute LBA on the disk, or the disk image, which is at uh, whatever that value is. I forgot already. But I can do this in the next video. I can parse it out, read it, and I can read the file from this position on the disk image. But I just wanted to check with XXD right quick. So I know the file size is going to be 512 bytes a block. Should be. So 512 times 71680, uh, 7, that should be the byte position on the disk image. 
corresponding to that LBA, and that should be where this file is at, which is just going to be the bytes testing for this being a text file. So if I look at that, I'll say, I don't know, 24, I'll say 32 bytes at that position. So I'll seek to this, uh, this number here, this byte position within the disk image, which is test HDD, we see we have testing. So those bytes are in the disk image, and I'm saying those bytes correspond to this file. So I can read that, these bytes from this position using block IO protocol, starting at this OBA or disk IO, starting at this OBA's byte value. According to the info we get from the block IO media for the block size and other things. And I should be able to read a file like this. So I, I think I'm going to do that on the next one because it's already been, you know, an hour and change. Uh, just keep it a little bit shorter and easier to edit. And I'll do that on the next one. And depending how well that goes, <laughs> I'll then change to read a binary file for, let's say, a test program. You can call it a kernel if you want. I don't think I need to do exit boot services and get memory map before just running a program. But if I do, I'll add those in. That's fine. But um, I'm going to say I'm going to read this text file, and then I'm going to make a little kernel that just takes in the frame buffer for the GOP. And then it will write to the screen or print something just to show that we can load and run a program. And then that'll change to be loading and running a, a fuller kernel later on. So hopefully that sounds interesting. Hopefully this video is OK. I didn't do that much but print data. but that's how it goes. <laughs> Read the spec and print the data according to the spec. But hopefully it was somewhat interesting, maybe. And uh, yeah, I'll see you on the next one. Yeah, I'm hoping my audio is a little bit better on this video too, going forward as well, because I redid my filter chain setup and gain and everything for, uh, for OBS. So hopefully less post-processing is needed and the, the compression's better for even volumes and DSing and uh, overall harshness is less and you know, clarity is better and stuff. So I can go through a setup on that as a video, maybe if people want, but if not, that's fine. Thank you for watching. Greatly appreciate it. I'll see you on the next one and we'll be a, a bootloader yet. So <laughs> I'll see you then. Cheers.